So now Jeffrey tells me that I'm signed up for the important keynote talk. This is the first time I've heard that, so I'll deliver for you in that vein. Um, I just want to thank Jeffrey and Nicole for organizing such a special conference. Um, I think what's going on here is very important, and I feel very lucky to be a part of this and to share this with you. So um, I'm going to talk to you today mostly about ultrasonic neuromodulation, but some other approaches that we've been investigating to accelerate the meditative path or contemplative practices. Uh, I, as Jeffrey said, uh, just a couple of disclosures, I am working with a company in Palo Alto called Alchemist with Jeffrey and Sanjay. Um, and I'm also a consultant on different projects that are involved in looking at neuromodulation to enhance meditation and other things. So um, back about 2005, I was a pretty nervous undergraduate student presenting my first poster at a major scientific conference called the Society for Neuroscience. If you don't know this conference, it's 15 to 20,000 neuroscientists, so brain scientists, you know, the smartest people in the world besides rocket scientists. And um, this is like a fourth or maybe even an eighth of the size of the posters. It's just giant and very scary, especially if you've got sort of a nervous disposition. And that year, the Dalai Lama was invited to give the keynote address, which was somewhat controversial. A bunch of scientists didn't want a religious leader talking at a big science conference. But he gave uh, what I thought was a very beautiful speech on the need to integrate ethics, and what he called secular ethics, not religious ethics, with science, especially with the sciences that are digging into the internal world. At some point, the brain sciences are going to sort of help us understand our internal phenomenological states, and that comes with it a lot of power. Um, so I thought it was a really beautiful talk, but at the end, he kind of went off script, as he usually does in his talks, and he basically said in, in these words, if you can invent a chemical or an intervention or a surgery that will help me to not have to meditate so much, I will do it. It was amazing. All right, as an undergraduate, I, I was actually having some, some ethical trouble. I was, I was researching on animals, and I just didn't like to do that. And so to hear this message you know, um, about this approach that you could use technology to help the Dalai Lama sort of not meditate, I was very excited about that. <laughs> and so at the end of the talk, someone asked again. They said, well, wait a minute. You just said something very interesting. So if we, brain scientists, can develop a method, so say a surgery or an intervention, that would remove suffering from your brain, Dalai Lama. Would you do it? Would you be the first one? And he said, I will be the first one. Tell me when it's ready. So as an, as a, as an undergraduate, I was very excited about this. I didn't know much about uh, meditation at the time. Um, but I was having a lot of sort of internal stress, and I was using that stress to sort of drive me in terms of taking tests, and there were social anxiety things that was going on. And so I went home and I learned about meditation, and I started trying it myself. And I pretty quickly experienced some of those shifts in well-being that Jeffrey was talking about. It was pretty obvious that this stuff worked. Just focusing your attention, doing what are called contemplative practices, I had a clear change in my internal state. And I realized that I didn't have to be driven by fear and anxiety and turmoil and stress all the time, that that didn't have to drive me to do good on a test, I could actually just calm down, study, and go take the test, and there you go, I can do just as good. So of course, at the same time, meditation was becoming popular throughout society, and there was a young science of meditation um, that started showing that meditation had all kinds of positive benefits. Now, of course, I think some of this has been a little bit overplayed, and you should know that the science is young and it's sort of still getting its footing, but it's pretty clear that you can do things like reduce blood pressure, uh, increase cognitive fun functioning in healthy people, and you can also ameliorate a bunch of psychiatric and neurological conditions. It works really well for things like chronic pain and even things like addiction. But the problem, of course, is that meditation takes a long time. Richie Davison just wrote a really beautiful book called Altered Traits. If you haven't read that, it's really great. And what it says, basically, is the reason meditation can shift you from the sort of anxious undergraduate that I was to something more like Jeffrey. And I don't, I don't think I'm there yet, but I'm moving in that direction is because you, you're sort of focusing on attention and focusing on these contemplative practices and changing your traits. But that takes a lot of effort. And if you could get something that works faster, you can help treat all of these disorders, as well as just our, our normal sort of you know, internal anxiety and angst. So about the same time, I went to graduate school. Um, and all the meditation that was changing my own internal world just went out the window. 
Graduate school started the first day I realized that I was an imposter, everyone was smarter than me, and I definitely should not be there. Um, it took me about two years to realize that everybody else felt that way as well. It's called the imposter syndrome. Um, but, you know, I, all that old conditioning came back, and I decided I have to be driven by stress and anxiety and fear because that's what's going to make me successful as a graduate student. Well, at the same time, um, I started working on these studies where they were putting deep brain stimulators in Parkinson's patients. So, um, let's see, this must be the laser. What you're seeing here is an electrode that's implanted down in the basal ganglia, and it's delivering little current of electricity. So, I started watching these surgeries and seeing the power of this technology. It transforms every patient's life. It's, I, I, I hesitate to say it was like a miracle, because scientists don't like to say things like that, but it was like a miracle. I mean, every time I saw this thing turned on. And so, you know, I started thinking back to what the Dalai Lama was saying. Can you use a technology to remove suffering or to help someone not have to meditate and get those life-changing effects from meditation without having to do all the work? So, of course, I'm not going to tell you today that we're implanting electrodes in the brain. You know that because Jeffrey set it up. But what we started investigating is whether we could use non-invasive methods, much like the non-invasive methods that Bashar was talking about earlier. Here's Shenzhen Young again, um, and he's putting a little direct current device on my head and trying to pass a little bit of electricity into my brain. And so what I'm going to tell, tell you today and what, what I'm going to try to support is this claim that non-invasive neuromodulation can vastly accelerate the contemplative path, um, what Shenzhen Young has called a techno-boost. And what's really cool about that and what Jeffrey sort of picked up on in his talk was, is that you could scale this to a much larger audience um, and you could apply it to lots of neurological and psychiatric conditions as well as to populations that don't have the time to meditate for two hours a day for the rest of their life or multiple lifetimes. So with that, I'm going to tell you, don't try this at home yet. Um, even with TDCS, I, it's relatively safe, but you know, if you're going to try it, try it once or twice. Don't do it every day for five weeks or something like that. We just don't quite know yet if it's okay to do that. And so all of the technologies that I'm going to tell you about today um, should be used in a controlled environment by professionals. I have a PhD, Jeffrey has a PhD, Bashar has a PhD and works with MDs in a medical facility. That's where these things need to be done, in the lab. And we follow principles like the Alara principle. So you use as little energy as possible to get the effect that you're going for. Now, of course, we're talking about transformative effects and transforming a you know, fundamental well-being. That's a pretty big bar, right? But still, there's a certain amount of energy or intervention that's going to get us there, uh, mixed with meditation or whatever the context is. And we want to do as little energy as possible. So um, you heard a little bit about neuromodulation from Jeffrey and Bashar, so I'm not going to go over this too much, but there's different ways to modulate brain function from outside the head without having to drill a hole. So direct current is one of these methods, so 9-volt battery hooked up to the head and you're just passing current over the head. Also, um, transcranial magnetic stimulation, uh, another device that we have in the lab. It's a very strong magnet, up to about a tesla and a half to two tesla that's passing a magnetic current, and of course, when you have a magnetic field this way, you have an electric field this way, so you can provoke very, very fine-grained uh, electric fields into the brain and actually cause brain activation. That's called TMS. And so what's great about these technologies is that you can modulate brain function in a way to boost practice. These are ways to get techno-boost if you act on certain parts of the brain that are involved in meditation, say, attention centers in the brain, for example. And what's really neat about these technologies is that you can not only cause brain activation or make the brain more likely to fire, but you can actually inhibit certain parts of the brain. So it might be the case that instead of trying to induce a state in the brain or in the person's phenomenology, really what you want to try to do is remove things that are barriers to well-being. So if you're like me and you have a bit of a ruminative mind, someone says something to you like, Jay, your talk was really stupid, nobody understood it, and you mumble a lot, right? That could be some feedback I get that could get locked into my head. And I could just think about that and think about that. And then when I'm having conversations later today, I won't even pay attention to the people in front of me. I'm just locked in. Well, what if you had a technology that could just subtly reduce that process while you're trying to meditate or while you're in the world so you can better pay attention to the task at hand or the stimulus that's in front of you? So that's the kind of possibility of these technologies. Uh, so Bashar mentioned this. We're all working together with Shenzhen um, and 
the uh, monastic academy to do one of the first full retreats with TDCS, with direct current stimulation. This is Bashar's Zendo device. Uh, he didn't sell it as much as I will. I've tried this device, and it is the best TDCS device I've ever used. I'm not affiliated with Bashar. He is a, Bashar's company. He's a very good friend. Um, but there's something special about this device, and I think you should go try it. So during the retreat, what's going to happen is we're putting the electrodes on a part of the brain that's uh, over the prefrontal cortex. It's involved in top-down attentional control, emotion regulation, um, and everything else that the prefrontal cortex is involved in, of course. And the idea is that these people are waking up from 4 a.m. to 9 p.m. This is a legit Zen-style meditation retreat. And they're going to get these devices over five days um, with a dose that's sort of titrated to what they like. And we want to know, is this going to help them get into deeper states in meditation, control their attention, and get a sort of a boost from the meditation practice. Um, but as Jeffrey said, what we're starting to learn from this new science of contemplative practice or meditation is that a lot of the structures that are involved in these practices are actually deep in the brain. So one of them is the posterior cingulate cortex, the PCC. Uh, insula and other things are just too deep for TMS and TDCS to reach. And so they've been sort of outside of the ability of the neuromodulation field to reach those and to enhance them during meditation. Unless you want to get surgery. I actually asked Stuart if he could, if he would let me sign up for surgery and do it. And uh, he said no. Um, Stuart Hameroff, who, who Jeffrey was talking about. So um, one of the slides that um, is, I think, a really interesting study this is uh, different types of meditation practices. So these are long-term meditators, 20, 30,000 hour people, loving kindness, focus attention, things like that. And what, what Judd Brewer showed is that these people have an underactivation in the PCC, the posterior cingulate, as well as the medial prefrontal cortex, relative to control people who were trying those same practices. They're in the scanner, they're trying to meditate, and you see a decreased activation. Now, this is part of the default mode network, which you all probably know about. It's involved in self-referential thinking. So during my talk, you might sort of start thinking to yourself about what you want to do, or you might be thinking to yourself about my talk. That's the internal mode. And once you put your attention back out and start paying attention to what I say again, that's the external mode. So there's this internal versus external. And through meditation practice and contemplative practices, what happens is that you tend to downregulate the default mode which, you know, you can make an inference from there, right? These people are just sort of more in the world, in the moment, you know, as meditation is trying to get you to do. And so if we want to really enhance meditation practice, we might want to get down to some of these deeper structures. Well, how do we do that? One way could actually be TMS, and this is a project that we're going to try, whereby you use the strong magnetic field, you try to hit uh, one of the nodes involved in the default mode network. So this is the proposed default mode network, and you can hit that with TMS, you can inhibit that, and then you can attempt to inhibit the whole network. Um, that's an ongoing project. We've been more interested in ultrasound, so this is sort of um, taking a back seat to that, but it's a possibility that we're going to try out. And actually, if you use healthy people who are just in the lab um, doing a task that activates the default mode, you can actually inhibit, um, sorry, you can actually inhibit this part of the brain and reduce self-referential thinking. So that's already possible, it just hasn't been tried in the context of meditation yet. And that's one for Bashar in his new lab, if he wants to take it. Um, so this is kind of what the setup looks like. This is the, the new frontier of transcranial technology with meditation. However, it may be the case that you really want to try to target those deeper structures directly. And that's what we've been really excited about and what Jeffrey prefaced in his talk. So how do we do that? Well. We know that these areas are involved in self-referential thinking. So this is a study where people are in the fMRI scanner. They're getting self-referential phrases. So I get angry. I never get angry, of course, right? So I say, no, my future is bright. Of course my future is bright, yes. So that tends to activate the default mode network, actually in the opposite pattern that you see to meditators. So the more you think about this self, the more you see activation there. So that's a big clue. If we really want to try to down-regulate the self mode, the self-referential system, during meditation, we probably want to just directly target this guy and downregulate it with some type of modality. So how do we do that? Well, we can use sound, believe it or not. So we're not talking about sound um, in the human hearing range, which is 20 hertz, 20 oscillations to 20,000 oscillations a second, but we're talking about ultrasound, 
which is typically used for therapeutic purposes all over the world, um, from infants all the way to um, people of age. And of course, you use it for medical imaging um, up around 2 megahertz. So this is 2 million oscillations a second up to 10 million oscillations a second. Now, what's important to understand about this, because I'm going to talk about putting ultrasound into people's brains, is that this is low-intensity ultrasound. So if you don't heat the brain up too much, things are OK. Heating is, is trouble, right? If you get too much of a fever above 104 degrees Fahrenheit, you have trouble. We know that heat in the brain is bad. And of course, ultrasound, um, if you're not using low intensities, can heat up tissue and it can ablate. Uh, so if you get ultrasound to kidney stones, for example, you can destroy the kidney stones and get them out of the body. So basically, we know, based on all of this research um, and sort of clinical practice, that there are short pulses, microsecond pulses of ultrasound, and you give, the, you give enough time for things to cool down in the brain, it's perfectly OK in the short term and the long term. So you can just unfocus ultrasound, and you can blast it through the brain, and you can hit any part of the brain. You can actually just ultrasound the entire brain, which is what they've done in rats and, s and animals with smaller brains. But you can also focus the ultrasound. So this is a curved transducer with a single element. And if you know um, how to curve the ultrasound and get it to interact deeply, you can actually make it focus the intensity at a little spot. And you can do that in the brain. If you use multiple transducers, you can actually focus it at different points, and you can change the focal depth, which is really a sort of cool trick of ultrasound, because you can actually hit one part of the brain and then move it back and hit another. You can actually, if you have multiple transducers, you can steer it around corners. I could start geeking out for about an hour on this, and I'm just going to, I'm just going to go on. Um, but you can imagine a full helmet transducer with, you could say a million, you could say 10 million, whatever you want, sub-element transducers, and you can start hitting fine-grained circuits in real time. So that's all very exciting, but coming in the future. There, in the last uh, five to 10 years, there's been a huge explosion in focused ultrasound for neuromodulation. So I just like this slide from Jamie Tyler's lab. This shows direct current, so you can actually see where the pad would be on the head, delivering direct current to the brain. Here's TMS. It's much more focal, as you can tell. Ultrasound is a different scale. You actually have to zoom in on another magnitude and deposit the energy just on a little gyre right here, for example. So it's a very exciting technology because it allows you to focus very deep. Um, lots of studies have shown that focused ultrasound can be targeted in the scanner. You can activate bold signal and fMRI, and you can actually deactivate the bold signal below um, baseline. You can get animals' whiskers to move. You can get individual whiskers, so it's very, very specific. And when you do it in humans, this is sort of what the beam looks like. So this is a human skull in the scanner. This is an ultrasound transducer on the outside. You can see a little bit of energy is pulling there, and then it's focusing it through, actually, to the thalamus in a human brain. A study just came out, Ligon et al. 2018, showing you can modulate thalamic activity and modulate uh, sort of the output to the thalamus on the somatosensory cortex. Pretty cool. And you can see, if you just look at this slice, it's very, very focal. From the other slices, it's spread out just a bit, but you can focus the ultrasound down to deep bits. So what that means that we have to be very s sensitive and careful about how we focus the ultrasound in the brain. And so we're using um, MRI-guided ultrasound. So we have to have an MRI on each of our participants. We have a little camera that tells us where that participant is in space, and then we can focus it down to any spot in the brain that we want um, with some relative um, error. So now what we want to do is try to modulate these deeper brain circuits during contemplative practices. So I told you about the posterior cingulate cortex. If you can downregulate the PCC, you could actually just temporarily shut down, not, not totally, but you could make someone's internal state quieter so they could then focus their attention out on the environment or on a task. And that's exactly what we've done so far. So in a couple participants um, in a pilot study, we've shown that by reducing the PCC temporarily and, and pretty massively, actually, surprisingly, reduces mental talk and self-chatter. Um, some people are actually reporting oneness with the environment, if that sounds familiar to some other interventions that you know about, um, and less attachment to self-referential thinking. So we actually use this probe where, before the experiments, we ask them what really triggers them. Donald Trump is almost always at the top of the list at this point. <laughs> Uh, and for me, I just, you know, I could actually look at my watch right now and the heart rate's going up. So, 
so during this intervention, we actually give them these little trigger words, and we see if they can deal with that or if they can just let these sort of sensations arise and pass. And for now, it's all self-report, of course, but people are reporting being able to sort of let those things come and go a little bit easier. Um, we have an fMRI study going, but I'm going to skip that and get to the fun stuff. So now we want to use a model of mindfulness or a, mindful, a model of contemplative practice. Um, Jeffrey has a beautiful model. There's other models out there, and we have different ways to sort of use these models to figure out which parts of the brain to target to give us these transformative effects that, that Jeffrey has alluded to. Um, Shenzhen has one that's pretty easy to explain. For Jeffrey's model, you're going to have to read the book. Um, I'd recommend everyone reading that. It's pretty awesome. Um, and the basic idea is that there's these different skills of attention that, when working together, create mindful awareness, create uh, more fundamental well-being and ability to apply your attention to the task at hand or to the environment. So equanimity is basically just being able to let sensory s stimulus arise and pass without grabbing onto it. So that analogy I gave you where I was talking about sort of a graspy mind, that would be low equanimity. It's almost like you're pouring honey into someone's brain and then everything gets kind of sticky. So the more equanimity you have, um, the higher, um, the sort of higher the flow of information can go through the brain. Sensory clarity is basically being able to track what's going on in the present moment. So you could test that with psychophysic tasks, for example. And concentration power basically means being able to concentrate on what you're trying to concentrate on. Concentrate on the breath. The better able you are to do that, the more concentration power you have. And so Shenzhen's claim is that increasing a skill in one of these quadrants, so say if you could increase equanimity, you actually get some of these other things almost for free as they're working together, and you can sort of boost someone into this very quickly. So, so Shenzhen uh, got really fascinated with this disorder called athymhormia. The question is, how do we do something like boost equanimity? And so these athymhormic patients get bilateral lesions in the basal ganglia. Actually, that circuit that I was putting electrodes down in when I was in graduate school, it's the same circuit. And it turns out that these people present with one of the most fascinating disorders of consciousness. Uh, in the literature, the doctors always talk about it as the most bizarre patients. They just come into the OR or they come into the doctor's office and they just sit there and they just sit there, and they will sit there for 12 hours, 24 hours, 48 hours, without doing anything. And then you say, hey, hey, Bob, what are you doing? And Bob says, I'm sitting here. <laughs> and the doctor's like, what are you thinking about, Bob? There's no thoughts. What are you feeling, Bob? No thoughts. But then if you do cognitive tasks on them, like there's, there's a guy actually at NYU who has this, a professor who can teach high-level uh, mathematics, I think it's prime number theory or something like that, but the thing is, is like he goes to his classroom and he just stands at the door until someone tells him to give the lecture. And as soon as you say, professor, time to give the lecture, he opens his notes, he gives the whole lecture, and then he literally just stops at the end. And his caretaker has to come and take care of him. So what's really fascinating about this, and I'll let you read this quote, is that it's, it's a... Uh, I'll just read it to you. They describe a mental state that, to our knowledge, has never been reported, and which is almost unimaginable to a normal human conscious being conscious awareness without any contents per se. So there's a famous case where a patient sat in the sun um, for like eight hours and she got third degree burns. They brought her into the ER and they said, well, what's, what's going on with you? you? You're like burning and your skin is pretty much falling off. And she said, well, it was the most painful pain I've ever had. This is actually in a study, a case study. And they said, well, why didn't you move out of the sun? This is crazy. And she says, well, pain, no pain, it's all kind of the same, right? And so Shenzhen looked at this and he said, wait a minute, <laughs> hold on a second. This is where we're trying to get to, right? <laughs> and of course, not exactly, right? Because this is extremely pathological. So I'm not gonna sit on stage and tell you we're trying to make athymhormics. Of course, we're not trying to do that. But there's a biophysical cause that we can see, anybody can see, Shenzhen likes to say a first year ma medical student can see the causes. Um, and they seem to be in an extreme state of equanimity, a pathological state of equanimity. But it's a clue to a circuit that we could put ultrasound into, downregulate it temporarily while someone is meditating, and give them an increased sense of equanimity. And if you could do that, then you can get that techno boost that we're so interested in. So that's pretty much exactly what we did on Shenzhen. 
Um, we built a single element transducer ultrasound system that is attempting to put ultrasound down in those parts of the brain that are damaged. This is not Shenzhen's brain, but this is sort of what the setup would look like. We target that area, and then basically Shenzhen comes into the lab. We use neuronavigation, and we target that while he's meditating. We do this over an hour period. It's a very, very, very low dose. We do like one microsecond pulse, and then we let it go for a couple minutes, and then we do another pulse. And we're trying to sort of gently and subtly downregulate the system so he increases his equanimity and increases all the other quadrants as well. And Shinzen and I, both being skeptically, scientifically minded people, we gave this uh, about a one in a million chance of even making him feel different. Um, about two weeks into the protocol, Shinzen started reporting drastic changes to the point where I said, oh, okay, shoot, I have to start placebo him, placeboing him now because maybe he's just really like, you know, placeboed into enlightenment or something like that, which would be a whole new field of study. Um, <laughs> and it turns out when I placeboed him, well, not much is going on. Shinzen said, well, I think you missed the target. You know, he would say things like that. He's, he's, he's very much able to uh, detect changes in his internal state. We gave it a rest because I didn't want to do too much ultrasound on him at once, and he came back uh, a couple months later, and he started saying things like, this has been the most significant intervention I've ever done in my whole life. Okay, so you may, you may know Shenzhen. He's a relatively famous meditation teacher. He's got a book called The Science of Enlightenment. I mean, he's been after this for a very long time. So to hear him say something like that was extremely significant. But being a scientist, of course, I wanted to know if other people felt this way. So we took five people into the lab. They all have a long-term meditation practice. Essentially tried the protocol on them again. And the take-home message is that it almost worked in these people. This is a measure of equanimity, so people feeling like they can just sort of let go a little bit easier. And after the protocol, after the fourth day, they actually jumped up on the scale. Um, this is something that's ongoing. So then we said, all right, let's try some other expert meditators. We tried Chuladasa. If you haven't read The Mind Illuminated, uh, I would definitely recommend looking this up right now. Go on Amazon and buy it if you're interested in meditation. Um, so Chuladasa has a model where basically uh, the higher you go in these stages, the sort of higher levels of consciousness you're achieving. And we tried just two days on him, neuronavigated to the same area of the brain, and basically he started reporting uh, meditative joy, very stable attention, and increased equanimity. And now, I try very hard not to prime people about this, although the word is getting out at this point. So I didn't tell Chuladasa to expect equanimity. He just spontaneously started talking about these things. Um, of course, you all know who this handsome guy is. Jeffrey, uh, then, Jeffrey and I started talking about these things and trying to figure out how do we validate this? How do we make sure this is real? You know, of course, placebo and suggestion are very powerful, so we want to know. So then I just tried it on him, of course. <laughs> and, Basically, what Jeffrey said, which um, is very significant, is that it pushed him further into what he calls PNSE, this deep sense of well-being that he was talking about. But the really interesting thing is at the bottom here. It took him to new forms of PNSE. And this is actually a theme that's been showing up over and over in the people that we've been doing this on, is that it's pushing them in the dimension of uh, meditation, deep meditation, meditative states that they're familiar with, but it's sort of teaching them something new about it. And that's something that was totally unexpected. Shenzhen has said this as well, and it's something that, you know, he, he kept telling me in the beginning, this is really significant, and I didn't really understand it until we sort of fully talked through it. Um, so that is really one of the most interesting things about this, is that we could push people into these deeper forms. So um, we started with the Dalai Lama. We still haven't gotten the Dalai Lama in yet. Maybe we should email him soon. I don't know if we're quite ready for that. I'm not, not quite ready to say we've created the button yet. But, um, you know, the Dalai Lama said, this is an actual direct quote from the Society for Neuroscience meeting, he said, I spent a few hours meditating every day. He kind of joked about it and said, I really don't want to be meditating so much. It's really a pain in the butt. And he really wants to read science, is what he was saying. But he has to meditate because there's all these negative emotions. And he said, if you can engineer enlightenment, if you can create a neuroscience-based enlightenment, he would do it. And he said, call me when it's ready. So right now, where we are is we've been able to increase one quadrant of one of the models of meditation, and we're going to try other ones as well. But what's really fun and what's fascinating is that now we have the possibility to go after all these different ones at, at the same time, and then things are going to get interesting. So thank you.